Hey everybody, so today we are going to go through the rest of ants and then I think we will get a little bit into bees um, and then we'll finish bees tomorrow. Today and tomorrow are going to be short lectures because it's American Thanksgiving and although American Thanksgiving matters not to me personally, it does matter a lot to my ailing parents and I'm supposed to be picking them up seafood today and taking it over to them for a late lunch and that involves some logistical work on my part. So we're gonna cut this reasonably short today um, and we'll finish off a little bit of the content tomorrow, but today and tomorrow should be pretty simple days. Next week, you'll have guest lectures uploaded for spiders and birds. I will produce lectures for uh, reptiles and amphibian sociality and um, fish. And then you'll be done with this course's content. And uh, I guess, I mean, I'll probably say this again I'm closer to the end, but although I didn't ever really saw much of you guys, I did enjoy lecturing to you and I do enjoy this content. And I'm looking forward to future versions of you guys where I get to interact with you. And I don't know how McMaster does assessments, but um, if you like certain parts of this course more than others, and you'd like to see those things drawn out and like embellished and, and you know, luxuriated in more, please alert me. Um, some of these things like the lectures will be longer <laughs> when I'm in person and there will be discussions that will be facilitated um, that are just not so conducive, I mean like Zoom is not so conducive to such things in a pandemic giant class scenario, um, but it, one day when we have this lecture in person, I think that that will add to the course as well, but if you want to see more or less of some content, please do alert me. Um, and if you like the course, please do alert me <laughs> so that I can teach it again or whether or not I want to teach other courses, blah, 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 blah. But if, if this course is popular and you feel that it fills an important um, educational niche that hasn't been already met by health sciences or biology or psych or neuroscience, then please do alert me because, you know, I just want to know where does this fit? Are you enjoying it? And how can I make it better um, in future generations of yourselves? Okay, enough of that. Okay, so we cut off last time talking about suicidal uh, defense mechanisms, which once you have workers that are sterile uh, and, they're def and they're spending their whole lives in service to the colony without any hopes of reproduction, personal reproduction, um, you get the evolution of suicidal defense mechanisms in these worker castes in some instances where they can forego future reproduction because they had none of it. And this enables, the, opens the door to elaborate self-destructive defenses that don't normally occur in animals that can reproduce again and again and again which are called idroparous. Okay, so idroparous organisms. All right, so nests, yeah, all these, all, like wasps, stinging wasps, uh, all, of these, uh, all of these social bees, and then all of these social ants, which are almost universally social uh, to a very high degree, they all have a central fortress that they create, and they have the capacity to defend it. So one, all of these things can sting or bite or defend themselves in some way. And it's, it's plausible to believe that these defense mechanisms are more advantageous, are more effective, effectual, if they are um, swarmed, if there are many of these things happening at once, you can overwhelm much more dangerous enemies by working in concert. Then, so all of these species have that, but then the, the, the importance of the nest, a central place on a, that contains important resources that might leverage a kind of microhabitat, tree cavity, rock crevice, rotting log that, are, that is rare and um, defensible uh, and valuable, um, that plus the ability to defend with these stings appears to be the special combination that gives, consistently gives rise to very high levels of sociality. Certainly in ants, which all share this feature, uh, among wasps, paper nests are, are tightly associated with the highest levels of sociality and arguably eusociality. And as we'll see in bees, again, it's these shared nests these shared fortresses, plus the ability to defend them, that creates the one-two punch that creates heightened levels of sociality that we see in bees, because not all bees are social. Not all wasps are all that social, but all ants are. So anyway, but they're all wasps, broadly speaking. Okay, so nests. Uh, they're sometimes simple. Sometimes it's just a pre-existing little crevice in a rock or a hollowed out acorn or a twig that's rotting. Lots of kinds of ants live in just such a simple nest. They have just one central chamber with an opening and they go in and out and, and the rest of the colony is organized within this central vacuole, one chamber. But many nests, as you can see, contain tunnels and subchambers where there's, there are brood or there are gardens or there's food processing. 
um, distributing resources across the colony. There are hubs. So, I mean, many nests, and certainly the nests that you probably think of when you think of an ant nest, have many, many chambers. You create an ant farm, you can see this multi-chambered nest, and these little roads, these highways that occur within them. Um, so they're incredibly elaborate in some species, and in such species, the group sizes tend to be larger, and there tends to be a greater level of division of labor among the workers, so there are more kinds of casts that emerge in more complex nested societies, there are larger group sizes, the colonies live for longer, the queens live for longer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the basal primitive condition is to have a relatively simple nest, uh, not that many workers, a few dozen to a few hundred, but highly derived species can have millions and millions of workers, dozens or hundreds of chambers of nests that can take up, you know, a third of an acre in some species, um, or take up the crowns of many, many trees and species of ants that weave um, leaves together and make like, they almost look like little tight spider webs, but they're actually, you know, um, structures produced by ants and arboreal species. And then sometimes the nests, um, ants have not just one nest, but can have many nests. So a monodomus um, species, what is a species that has a single nest, whether that is a simple nest or a complex nest. It's one continuous nest. Many species are polydomous though. So one colony, one queen, or if it's a, if it's a polygynous society, multiple queens that are working together, um, can have many nests that have some traffic that moves between them, but basically have decentralized um, nest complexity so that instead of having many, many, many chambers in one area, can distribute that complexity across many little uh, sub-nests throughout, throughout an area. Movement between those sub-nests is imperiling, but it also means that you can distribute your resources across multiple nests. So if one nest should be assaulted or succumb, then there are other nests nearby. So there's a, there's a bet hedging element to this. Additionally, um, a polydoma strategy um, increases the odds that if there's a resource that's identified somewhere in the environment, that you'll have one of your nests reasonably close to it to be able to access that resource. Versus if you just had one nest, you have one central place that you're foraging from, then sometimes those, those, those resources are going to be quite far away, and that takes up a lot of time and energy to transport that food back to that nest. So there's several advantages to having a polydoma society. Decentralizing threats by um, having not all of your eggs in one basket, sometimes literal eggs, sometimes queens, sometimes sometimes just workforces, et cetera, et cetera, brood. Um, and they also have uh, the central place foraging problem. They have many central places, so they oftentimes have shorter distances to their resource that they're traversing. But they have increased risk from transporting brood, queens, and workers between those nests when, in fact, when they do that, when they split the colony. And oftentimes they're episodically polydomous, so some species will expand out and have many nests during the summer and then contract to a single nest during the winter, and then expand out during the summer and then retract back to a, to a monodomous um, nest in the winter. The truth is, we don't really know why some species have polydomous strategies and monodomous strategies. No one's ever really demonstrated that any of the things I just said to you are actually what causes or even influences this monodomous versus polydomous strategy. No one's got any clue. Only one or two people study it on planet Earth and they don't really know that much about it. They spend most of their time teaching that doing research and honestly, Who's it hurting not knowing whether or not a polydomous or monodomous strategy is advantageous for in habitats A, B, C, D based on traits A, B, C, D. But you should know much of the ant, uh, ant diversity uh, at the colony level, functional level, is explained by episodic polydomy, um, uh, facultative polydomy, or fairly constitutive poly polydomy. So whether or not it's flexible through time, whether or not they do it sometimes but not others, or, well, or relative, or whether mature colonies consistently have constitutive um, uh, polydomous um, uh, statuses or uh, traits, uh, we, we don't know what causes those, that variation and or its functional consequences. It is a mystery and it explains a lot of the variation that we see in colony structure, but we just don't know what its function or evolutionary origin might be. I've given you some hypotheses, but again, people don't really know. Okay, some ants take the whole nest notion and throw it right out the window. This is relatively rare, but they're neat enough to talk about. So there are army ants, which have a nomadic phase, which basically are giant carnivores that rove around the rainforest and mow down all the, all the prey insects in their way and maraud and attack any humans, including researchers that are stupid enough to get in their way as well. <clears throat> if you're gonna have this nomadic phase where the whole colony, which is the workforce and the queens and the brood, if that's gonna be moving around all the time through space, accessing resources that are temporary, so you have to track them through the, through the rainforest, you you can't really have a nest, not certainly not a, mon a monodomous nest. You can't even really have a polydomous nest because you might be traversing 
uh, 50 yards, 100 yards between days and moving over and over and over in a line. So you'll, you can traverse half of a mile or a mile over a few months. You can't have those sorts of distances, even if you're polydomous. The different subnests in a polydomous society are not, are, are not spaced that far apart. Usually they're just a few feet or maybe a few meters away at most. So ants that are highly carnivorous that are accessing temporary resources that are ephemeral and could be quite far apart in between patches, they have an episodic phase where they're nomadic. So they'll move together in a giant line and all of them will move their brood. And as you might imagine, when they're being nomadic, the higher proportion of the society works. And then when they get to a new spot that's reasonably secure, they then find the base of a tree or an invagination or something to tuck the society into. They put their queens and brood into that. And then they just basically make a wall of workers called a bivouac, uh, a living nest, of uh, a superstructure, a living architecture of all ants that produce basically the general gist of a nest. It's defensible. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it, it takes up a, an important microhabitat. It, um, it then produces a microenvironment in the interior of the colony that protects the brood, the queen, produce a, a, fair bit of, a fair bit of humidity and decreases temperature swings in the day and night. And so it recreates a lot of the things that nests are supposed to do, but it does it through living architectures because those species tend to be nomadic. It's rare, but that's the term bivouac. And that's what one looks like right there. When you see these things in the forest, they're quite frightening. All right, this is what a weaver, uh, a w one species of weaver uh, ant might look like. So they weave with using silk, these leaves together. It would look like a spider would live on the inside of that, but it's actually just a colony of ants. And, uh, and these species tend to be highly polydomous. So once you see one weaver nest, weaver ant uh, colony uh, nest, there's oftentimes many in the, in the same area and there's ants running back and forth between them. So when the, when the, the living tree itself determines how big a specific nest can be. Large colonies of ants resolve this conflict by having many, many nests nearby and just basically consume sometimes a whole crown of a tree and a large tree. So nests are beneficial. They provide a constant microenvironment, certain kind of temperature, certain kind of humidity, certain kind of light levels. Uh, they're more easily defended. They're usually smaller openings. There's, there are structures, biomaterials, silk, or living structures that defend the most vulnerable components of the colony, like the queen and the brood. Um, they can remain hygienic, so you can groom the interior of this nest and make it much more hygienic and um, microbially consistent and controlled than the external environment. Um, but as I said before, one of the costs of having a nest is that you have a central place from which you have to forage. And so that if your food is episodic and can sometimes be far away or close or be distributed across space in a, in a, in a, in a, in a somewhat random uh, way, then that means that monodomous colonies oftentimes have to move quite far. Polydomous societies can oftentimes have shorter distances and nomadic societies just resolve the whole thing by just taking the colony over and over and over, moving it around. Sometimes nomadic species occupy different physical structures. They'll move from one log to another log to another log. So there's still nomadic species that don't have bivouacs, but the most famous nomadic species have bivouacs. So nomadic does not necessarily mean bivouac, but all bivouacs are nomadic species. Bivouac exhibiting species are nomadic species, but some nomadic species move from nest to nest through the environment, and that's how they resolve this central place foraging problem. All right, <clears throat> farming. So, uh, the most impressive, largest, most complicated, most um, uh, caste diverse um, societies of ants are the farming ants. So the ants aren't vegetarians. They're not carnivores. They eat a fungus. And they eat a fungus that needs to have masticated plant leaves mixed with uh, insect saliva to grow. And then they eat that fungus. So uh, leaf cutter ants wander out into the environment cut up leaves, bring those leaves back to their home, to their home nest, then they masticate up the, the chew up the leaf material, they um, mix it with saliva, and then they plant fungus on that, on that masticated plant material. Or um, once the fungus is sporulating on the inside of uh, these, uh, these gardening chambers, which are special chambers and have special workers that, that attend these gardens, um, it's, a, it's, it's a task that individuals often spend most of their lives doing, um, specific individuals. Uh, the ants eat the vegetative, i.e. non-reproductive component of that fungus. So they collect plant material, they process it, they eat the fungus in these special gardens, and then they distribute those resources around the colony using a trophallaxis network. 
Lower gardeners are less fancy, so they cultivate species of fungus that are still found outside of these gardens. So that fungus still has a full-time job. Many, much of this fungus is still out there in the wild, decomposing leaves under normal conditions. They're just they've taken that, that fungus and it's growing wildly in this garden as well, and the plants are, and, the, and the ants are eating it. Higher gardeners have specific strains of fungus that have evolved, that are unique now, that only live inside of these plant, uh, this, these ant fungal gardens. So higher gardeners have unique endemic species of fungus that have been domesticated by these ants and uniquely can only be found in these gardens. If you take that fungus and these higher gardeners and you try to go plant it out in the wild, it dies. It has to be tended to in order for it to live. So it's like, I don't know. I mean, like imagine the way we've domesticated lots of animals, like good luck taking a Persian cat that struggles to breathe at rest and throwing it outside and seeing whether or not it fares well in a rainforest, right? Some things have been domesticated to the point that they're no longer functional. Look like a pug. <laughs> like, like, anyway, I'm not gonna talk anymore about domesticated things that we've you know, warped through selective breeding and uh, animals uh, in, in human societies, but know that we're not the only things on earth that domesticate um, domesticate uh, animals, plants, fungus. We're not the only ones in the world that do this, and ants, higher gardeners have done this for tens of millions of years, and certainly way before we did. All right, <clears throat> gardeners also have the highest level of cast complexity, so they'll have, you know, 12 different casts, nine different casts, 20 different casts, uh, versus most species of ants have one worker cast, one morphological type plus the queen. Many species, uh, like maybe 10%, have majors and minors, two morphological casts, in the workforce plus queens um, and drones, which don't do anything. And then uh, these, these gardeners though can have a dozen different uh, morphological castes within their society. So they reach large, large sizes, they have domestication, they have huge groups that live, uh, live a long time and they have many specialized subcasts or castes within their workforce. As I alluded to previously with bivouacs, one of the cool things that ants can do is they can make makeshift colonies and superstructures that uh, enable them to endure a kinds of environments that would otherwise kill individual ants. So by clinging together in really tight uh, rafts during floods, rafting ants can make a hydrophobic raft that really does kind of float atop the water, right? Give it a buoyancy that is above and beyond the body of a singleton ant. And they can save their queens and indeed much of their broods by making these structures when there's seasonal heavy rains. Many ants can produce chains in across uh, leaves or branches in the rainforest that drastically cut down on the, um, uh, the length of the traffic lines that have to occur between the nest and food. If you can shorten those by making living structures like bridges that other workers can move back and forth across, that's a major advantage. A major advantage. They can make bridges like such bridges over water as well, allowing the transport of brood, queens, and a workforce from uh, a place, a section of uh, the habitat that's flooded to a place that's not flooded, so they don't have to sit there and raft the whole time. Sometimes, in other words, these rafts basically make little chains across the, the water that they can move transport materials across as well. Bivouacs, the those living nests that army ants use in the rain in rainforests are another example of these superstructures. And it's important to note that right now, um, in micro, -engineer, micro engineering oftentimes takes like these tiny little ants and the strategies that they use to make these superstructures very dynamically based on the uh, env environmental circumstances. And they use these as inspiration for things like swarm robotics and micro engineering by thinking about many robots working together to complete complex tasks and possibly making superstructures that resolve uh, particularly challenging tasks when and if a situation arises. So computer scientists, engineers, um, even industrial psychologists have long looked at sorts of mammal, uh, I'm not mammal, animal um, uh, naturally engineered systems to use as inspiration for human engineered systems. So we can engineer systems, but evolution of engine has, has engineered many systems to meet various kinds of challenges. And oftentimes we can see analogous challenges between those two spheres. And uh, we draw inspiration from uh, the kinds of engineering produced by evolution to resolve our own issues in engineering and computer science. So on that note, I didn't get as far as I hoped, but we'll cover bees tomorrow, but hopefully you enjoyed that, and I will catch you guys again reasonably soon. Enjoy your American Thanksgiving. I know that it probably can't possibly matter to you at all, but, you know, happy American Thanksgiving. Anyhow, have a good one. Congratulations on Biden. Take it easy.